Good afternoon. Uh, most, most of you have spoken who have studied the Arthashastra and your expertise in Sanskrit and history. I am a IR scholar and these are some thoughts that I put together. Uh, many years ago there was this Professor Walter McDougall, an international historian, who used to edit this journal called Orbis. And in every issue that was published, he would, he would have, have a small, small column in his part of his editorial. It used to be called Night Thoughts of an IR Professor. professor. Well, well, these, these are, I finished, I finished it last night at 11.30, so my script, so I assume, assume these are <laughs> Night Thoughts of an IR, IR scholar, scholar in IDSA. IDSA. So what whatever I say is with reference to how we can incorporate the study of Arkhavtalya uh, uh, Shastra and, and how, how we can use it to enhance and improve the uh, the the the, the uh, what is the word uh, enhance the Indian discourse on international affairs and that is the main theme of uh, what I'm going to speak about. I also feel, feel a little inadequate uh, considering that what uh, the NSA had said and what Dr. Gupta said early in the morning. I may, I may be repeating, repeating some of these, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll try and keep it short. There are, there are three, three main reasons, in my view, why we, we need to study the Arthashastra. Shastra. First, First, of course, it is the earliest treatise on statecraft written anywhere in the world. And, and being in Indian origin, origin, we need to celebrate this heritage and then by, by providing it a prominent place in, our, uh, uh, in the Indian discourse on international relations. relations. Second, the Arthashastra continues to be relevant because of the key insights it provides about the enduring nature of the state and of the interstate system, as well as because of the framework of thought and action it prescribes for states to navigate through the system. Now, there are many insights many people have talked about, but for me, I think three of these insights and the prescriptions that follow from it are particularly important. Number one, the state, the state is based on power backed by legitimacy, and, and consequently, there is a need for constant efforts to enhance both the power and the legitimacy of the state. Number two, the state ceaselessly engages in the pursuit of wealth and power and self aggrandizement in an anarchic interstate system in which Matsyanyaya prevails and where frequent wars and struggles for supremacy occur. And, and three, the, the doctrine of a mandala provides both a categorization of states and their interrelationships, as well as prescriptions on how to exploit this matrix to one's own advantage. Now, there, there are other, other uh, uh, insights, but I would, I would not highlight it you know, uh, from the IR perspective at least. But, but the third and even, even more important reason uh, for studying the Arthashastra, Shastra, and, and which, which is the focus of what I'm going to speak about now, is, is to provide a boost for the discipline of international relations in India. A, a discipline that I think it's widely acknowledged within India as continuing to wallow on the margins of the global discourse in this field. While, While a number of factors have been identified for the state, for the state of affairs, there was a symposium workshop held in Singapore a few years ago and several papers were presented there. One of the most important uh, factors for the state of affairs, in my own view, is the neglect of India's diplomatic history. And this is a history that dates back to 2,500 years at least, to the era of the Mahajanapada that was referred to earlier, and a history which includes the rise and fall of great Indian empires, as well as the operation of a very vibrant interstate system during the interregnums between these uh, great Indian empires. Here, Here, I, I want, want to spend us a little time to, to briefly contrast the scope of the field of international relations as it is taught and researched in India and, and what prevails in Western countries, especially the Anglo-American Anglo world, with, with which uh, I'm more familiar, familiar with. In, in India, the study, study of international, international relations is, is limited to contemporary affairs dating back to India's independence and the years since the end, end of the Second World War. Even, Even within, within this limited, limited scope, the, the field is heavily skewed in favor of area studies, 
with, with its, its emphasis upon bilateral relations and, and developments within individual countries or a particular region. As a, As a result, result, the field of international, international relations in India has, has largely come to be equated with area, area studies, that, that too with an emphasis upon current and contemporary affairs. affairs. This, this is, is not to mean that other sub-disciplines and functional areas are completely ignored. Uh, JNU, I think the, the alma mater for me and for most people here, has, has very vibrant, vibrant programs on nuclear deterrence, deterrence arms control, disarmament, diplomacy, diplomacy international, international economics, law, international, international organization, and, and international politics and theory. Nowhere, Nowhere however, is diplomatic, diplomatic history taught or researched. Or as I, I referred, referred to earlier in the morning, the Center, Center for Historical Studies is, is very, very consciously limiting itself to social and economic history. In, in contrast, the study, the study of international, international relations in the Anglo-American Anglo world starts with the diplomatic history of the ancient Greek city-state system, traverses through the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, then jumps, jumps to the rise of the European states in the modern era and, and the operation and global expansion of the European interstate system, the international system we all inhabit today, before coming to the Cold War and its aftermath. For instance, the, the cause on grant strategy offered at Yale University by John Lewis Gaddis includes the following topics of discussion. Sun Tzu's Art of War starts with that. Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, Machiavelli's The Prince, the events surrounding the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, the ideas of Immanuel Kant, the diplomatic craft of Prince Metternich, Clausewitz's On War, Bismarck and the rise of Germany, the rise of the United States, the geopolitics of imperial, democratic, and authoritarian states in the modern era, and finally the Cold War and its end. Given, Given this sheer breadth and scope, scope of the study of the diplomatic history as, as an integral part of IR in, in the West, and, and the serious engagement of Western scholars in the development of IR theory, theory it, is it is but natural that, that the Western discourse has attained a hegemonic position in, in this field. Now, now if we, we in India are, are to aspire to carve out a niche for ourselves in this international relations firmament, we have, we have no, no choice but, but to emulate Western, Western scholarship in, in diplomatic history. history. At, At least that's what it appears to me to be. There, there can be no better way to emulate them than by studying our own experience of war, the diplomacy, and statecraft as practiced by the great Indian empires in various kingdoms and dynasties over the last 2,000 years. I believe there are some limitations and constraints when it comes to studying ancient uh, Indian diplomatic history because of the absence of written uh, records except for Ashoka's edicts, and there is this unreliable nature of some of the Greek sources that are available. But definitely, these constraints do not apply to later periods. Now, now it, it is within, within this broader focus upon the diplomatic history of pre-1947 India that I think we should locate the study of ancient Indian treatises such as the Arthasastra and also other treatises, I think Ambassador Haksa talked about it, uh, uh, one of these, and Colonel Gautam is, is very keen to work on the Tirukkural uh, next as uh, one of the texts that we should study as part of this project. But I, I would say, say that, that we should locate it within the broader focus upon diplomatic history. Now, now studying, studying this history will, will enrich the Indian discourse in, in international relations, including by, by providing a laboratory to, to test and enrich the concepts and theories postulated both by contemporary scholars as, as well as by classical Indian, Indian thinkers like Kautilya. And ultimately, ultimately a more, more rigorous Indian discourse on international, international relations would, would enrich, enrich our collective understanding and, and help India navigate, navigate through the shoals of international politics. politics. After, After all, the key, key question in the study of international relations has always been not, not what, what should we know, but what, what should, should we do? What, what should we do to, to deal with the security challenges and, and foreign policy predicaments that countries face? With that, I close. Thank you.